Nat Turner's revolt's the most deadly revolt in America, most deadly slave revolt in American history. Uh, it happens in August of 1831 in a county, Southampton uh, County in Virginia, right on the North Carolina border. He starts off with a band of six, six rebels, and they go for about a day where they kill about 50, 50 whites, women, children, men, anyone that comes across their path. It's the most deadly slave revolt in American history, but it's, it's relatively well, uh, relatively, relative to uh, Robert E. Lee at least, not well known. And it's something that I think Civil War historians probably pay too little attention to. And I'm going to begin today my talk talking about a review of my book that showed up in Civil War news. And uh, an author named Jonathan Knowles raised a question that I think is f a fair one. What does this revolt, Nat Turner's revolt, have to tell us about the Civil War? Let me quo clo uh, quote the close of the review. At first blush, those interested in the Civil War might ignore Breen's volume, since it examines an event that occurred three decades prior to the war. And I can just see the publicist at Oxford University going, ignore? No, that's not a good idea. Please don't. Please don't. Nonetheless, he continues and says, those who wish to gain a deeper understanding of an important milestone for a nation that was on its path towards its greatest political crisis and additional insight insight into the slave's complex world will find Breen's study essential reading. And now this is where my publisher goes, ooh, essential reading, that's good. Now, despite the fact that my mother tells me that Noel's answer is both obviously right and absolutely convincing, I want to spend some time this afternoon flushing out the relationship between my book and the Civil War. What do you, who are here this weekend, and are obviously interested in the Civil War, have to learn from me, someone who has written a book on an event in Southampton County 30 years before the war. Now, it would be great if I could make a direct connection. If I could say, well, somehow, you know, Abraham Lincoln was shaped by this revolt. And then I'd write a book on that and get a full, full tent. Everyone would be here. Uh, but I can't make the compelling direct connection to the war. It's not the event that starts the war. And you can see this when you look at the history of Southampton's most famous Civil War general, Union General George H. Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga. Now, on the day of the revolt, James Gurley came galloping past the massive oak before Elizabeth Thomas's white plantation house. Get out, he shouted. Take your family and run, now! The renegade slave leader, Nat Turner, was coming with a band, full of a band of vengeful slaves, rampaging from farm to farm, killing men, women, and children. George Henry Thomas, 15, piled into a carriage with his mother's and sister, his mother's, his mother and sisters, and racked along the dirt roads into the darkness. Before they had gone far, afraid the assassins would overtake them, they abandoned the carriage and took to the swamps. In and out of gloomy mill swamp across Cypress Bridge in the bottomlands of the Nottoway River, they escaped the county seat of Jerusalem, some 12 zigzag miles from home. Now that, that quote comes from Ernest Bergson's article on Thomas and the Smithsonian. But this raises an obvious question. What's the relationship between what must have been a dramatic event for a 15-year-old boy and his later famous self? Can we see the future Union general in the events of 1831? Can I break this into more specific questions? Did this revolt put George Thomas on a career path that ends, takes him to West Point and ends up with him in the Union Army? At this point, the evidence is pretty thin. Thomas was recommended to West Point by John Young Mason, the most prominent politician in Southampton County. But it was in 1836, five years after the revolt, Moreover, the triggering event for the appointment seems not to have been the revolt, but the death of George Thomas's uh, uncle, James Rochelle, an important and prominent figure during the slave revolt himself. Rochelle had taken Thomas, whose own father had died earlier, under his wing. But with Rochelle's death, it appeared that Mason wanted to put Thomas on a path to independence and got him the appointment in the military. <clears throat> 
Did the revolt contribute to John H. Thomas's view on slavery or his decision, unlike Robert E. Lee, who we just heard about, um, to cast his lot with the Union? Having read the biographies of Thomas, I find no convincing evidence for how the revolt affected his views, although a traumatic event like this would have been, it's hard, it's hard to imagine how an event like this wouldn't have affected his views. So it's unclear if there's anything more than a coincidence that the future Union general was almost killed, and it is almost certainly that the almost in that sentence is not a very close almost, by the most deadly slave revolt in the history of the United States. If we broaden the question from Thomas to, to the whole entire Southampton revolt, it's likewise hard to see a direct connection between the revolt and the Civil War. Although, and there's one important caveat here, following the Civil War, the Virginia State Legislature took up plans, took up a proposal for gradual emancipation. And it is incredibly hard to figure out what a Civil War would look like 30 years later had that plan passed, if Virginia had put itself on the path towards emancipation. Despite this caveat, I can't and I don't want to John Brown you and argue that this was the first event of the war. I'm not going to argue that this event, while it was important, somehow set the, path, the country on a path to civil war. And if you look at the textbooks in American history, so many of them will date you know, that period of sectional conflict to 1831 and 1832, 1830 and 1831. Often, they're thinking of the starting of the publication of The Liberator by William Lloyd Garrison. But there's also, for, especially for those who are looking at black agency, people who are going to date it to David Walker's appeal or Nat Turner's revolt. So if I can't say there's this direct connection, this is the event that triggers the Civil War, somehow many dominoes down the road, what does Turner's revolt have to teach us about the Civil War? To answer this question, I want to make a distinction. I think there's two fundamental ways to think about the Civil War. The first is that from 1861 to 1865, America's constitutional political system broke down. The country, or perhaps they were countries at this point, could not resolve the question of whether slaves, states that had joined the Union were able to secede. As, Clarl, uh, as Carl von Clausewitz, who coincidentally died five days after Nat Turner's execution, wrote in his classic on war, war is a mere continuation of policy by other means. In this view of the Civil War, America went to war not because of some slave rebels or figures like John Brown. According to this view of the war, the war started because the political system failed to ha handle the problems that were related to the annexation of Texas and the acquisition of lands from Mexico that happened after the Mexican-American War. Unlike the Articles of Confederation, which failed at the simplest problem of raising revenue for the government, but succeeded impressively at forming states, something that can be seen in the Northwest ordinances, the Constitution and its antebellum political system really struggled with the incorporation of new states. In, 19, in 1819, the political system, which was in the midst of what was seen, of, seen as the era of good feelings, almost fell apart when Missouri applied for statehood. According to Thomas Jefferson, this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at, at, at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed, indeed, for the moment. But this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographic line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men will never be obliterated. And every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. Of course, the Union did not fall apart in 1820, but one can see in this crisis a preview of the future crises that would re be repeated with the Mexican-American War and the Wilmot Proviso, the short-lived Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Bleeding Kansas, Dred Scott. The second party system fell apart when the, question of ex uh, when the question became the expansion of slavery. And when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, the South bolted. 
but why did the South secede? Some may say it was for states' rights. Most Southerners believe that the Constitution was a compact, and having decided that they did not like the direction of the Republican-led government, they left the Union, or at least tried to. But what was so bad about having Abraham Lincoln as president? This is where I look to the election of 2016, and I look for a single-term congressman with a self-depreciation, self-depreciating sense of humor, and a rare skill with the pen. It was that he led a party that was dedicated to, the to stopping the expansion of slavery. Even a proposed 13th Amendment that would guarantee slavery where it existed was not enough to quell the fears of Southerners. So the political crisis became a military problem, and the military problems that the South faced overwhelmed those faced by the North. The North won the war, and the Union stayed together. But this brings up a question that is pestered scholars for generations. Why did so many white Southerners who did not own slaves support a war that began on an issue tangential to slavery? Historians have provided lots of answers. Some have doubled down on states' rights, insisting that the questions of slavery and the questions of states' rights were distinct and Southerners were focused on the latter. But that strikes me as wrongly revisionist and impossible to square with what states like Alabama said in their secession ordinances. And I quote, whereas the election of Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin to the offices of president and vice president of the United States of America by a sectional party avowedly hostile to the domestic institutions and to the peace and security of the people of the state of Alabama preceded many and dangerous infractions of the Constitution of the United States by many of the states and the people in the northern section, it is a political wrong of so insulting and menacing a character as to justify the people of the South, uh, of the state of Alabama in the adoption of prompt and decided measures for their future peace and security. They don't succeed, if they don't succeed, if they don't secede, they're worried about the stability and the safety of their own society. If one accepts then, then, as Lincoln did in his second inaugural, that the slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest and all knew that this interest was somehow a cause of the war, why did Southern whites fight? Why did 750,000 men die? Historians have come up with lots of different explanations for this. Some have argued that slavery in the South was a distinctly honor-bound society. That was the, I don't know if anyone's seen the free state of Jones yet, but that's the answer they put out in that movie, suggesting that there's an incompatibility between these two regions. Some argue that the South had a culture of political deference, which meant that the slaveholders were in power in the South in ways that they were not elsewhere in America. Some argue that slavery had broad support, whether because non-slaveholders had aspirations of being slaveholders or because of the way that the institution broadened the support for slavery. In 2007, Chandra Manning argued the Southerners were fighting a defensive war to protect their homes, at least as they conceived them. In The Land Shall Be Deluged in Blood, I explore the explanation of culture of deference, in particular using the idea of hegemony. This is an idea associated with a teacher of mine named Jean Genovese. While Genovese clearly thought that the slaveholders held the whip in society, at least on any question that was fundamental to the, to the, uh, fundamentally connected to the question of slavery, it was not exactly clear how slaveholders got nine slaveholders to go along with them. It wasn't as if the slaveholders had, uh, the nonholders and, sla and slaveholders had the same interest or were blind to the differences in their interest. And you all know the objections to the 20 slave rule in the Confederate draft. In fact, in the days after the revolt, the differences between slaves and slaveholders came, uh, uh, came to the fore as the non-slaveholders came to realize that the slaveholders' most valuable form of property might just slit their throats. As a result, non-slaveholders attacked the slaves viciously to such a degree that the slaveholders began to worry about a new threat Southampton's whites, who in response to Nat Turner's, uh, in response to Nat Turner, might just wipe out the slave population of Southampton. In fact, my title, The Land Shall Be Deluged in Blood, was not said by a rebel, but said by a petition to the Virginia legislature arguing for this proposal to uh, end slavery 
on the grounds that if they didn't do it, the whites were going to kill all the blacks after the revolt. In the second half of my book, I try to show how the standoff between the slaveholders and the, sl and the non-slaveholders morphed. As the news came of the revolt, there was a remarkable split in the interest of slaves, the slaveholders and the non-slaveholders. Non-slaveholders wanted to know how they could survive in a world where the slaves were killing whites. Slaveholders wanted the same. But unlike the non-slaveholders, they saw that one solution, a black genocide, might lead to safety, but only in a way that would impoverish the richest in society. So what did the slaveholders do after Nat Turner's revolt? At first, they declared martial law just to stop the killing. And in fact, it was incredibly effective. After this revolt, which killed where about 50 whites were killed, you know, and there was places where there was a schoolhouse that got hit and 10 people died, you know, a man's wife and, and nine kids. I mean, it's you know, so, sort of a tragic place, a certain place that would get a lot of people incensed. But in the aftermath of the revolt, only about three dozen blacks died, which is a number much smaller than most historians had estimated. Martial law was effective in stopping the non-slaveholders from killing the slaves in the days after the revolt. Just, it just stopped it. But it was unsustainable. You can't declare martial law and keep martial law in Southampton County for 20 years. At some point, the, non -slave the slaveholders had to figure out a way to get the non-slaveholders to agree. And I argue that they did this by telling stories about the revolt that made the revolt seem not as large or not as dangerous. They did this by holding rebel defendants to a relatively high bar for conviction. So there weren't actually that many people convicted after the revolt. Nineteen uh, were hanged, most of whom it seemed had very, very strong evidence against them. And there's some cases where people were not hanged after the revolt that are absolutely astonishing. There's, uh, there's one case, this is my favorite, where a guy's sitting there, he's not involved in the revolt at all, but they heard that there's a revolt going on, so the slave is lying out on the side of the road just saying, I'm not working today, not happening. And this woman came by and heard, the British are here, the British are invading. And the British invasion had been associated with slave revolts and slave resistance for, since the American Revolution. Well, the slaves knew it was a slave revolt going on. And he said, well, you know, it's a slave revolt going on. I hear you may die, but don't worry. I'll take care of your kids for you. Afterwards, you know, he's brought up and tried for this. And I'm like, this guy's joking with this woman, threatening her. She's going to die. And he wasn't killed. He wasn't killed. He was convicted. He was convicted, so we have the evidence, but he wasn't killed. Anyway, they published a, 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 a pamphlet called The Confessions of Nat Turner, which made Turner seem like a prodigy, which he was. So it wasn't that hard to work with that. But as a result of what they did in the courts and in the confessions, Whites became less fearful. And I want to point to two stories that I tell at the end of my book that shows how effective leaders were in their ability to isolate those who wanted to punish blacks. And the first story happens at this church. Uh, it's an old church of David Barrow, uh, Mill Swamp Baptist Church. It's not in Southampton. It's two counties over, an Isle of Wight. After the revolt, the question came up, what was going to happen in these interracial churches? Right? These churches had blacks and whites, they don't, they don't come together every Sunday, but they would come together on communion days where everyone would come for communion. What, what was gonna happen in these churches? Well, some of the whites in these churches said, you know what, I don't really feel like taking communion with those black people because I'm afraid they're gonna kill us. Okay, well here's a moment where the church can do whatever it wants. It can kick out all the blacks if it wants, right? The whites control the church. What are they going to do? And everywhere in the region, and in Mill Swamp Baptist Church, the, what, the blacks are brought back into communion. They're not brought into communion on any egalitarian terms. I mean, they're, they're, in fact, there's more segregation pushed after us. There's more racism brought into the church ceremony afterwards. Well, at Mill Swamp Baptist Church, there's a group of whites who are disappointed with this. No, we really don't want to go to communion with the blacks. We want them kicked out of the church. So 10 of them got together and said, we're leaving. If you're going to communion, you, you got your choice. Here's 10 of us. We're going to go. You can have the blacks or us. And they went to the church, and they said, that's your choice. And the church said, we will have an interracial church. 
you have your letters for dismission, you're free to go. Now, it was a bluff, and six months later, they came back into the... But all of a sudden, the, the, the community got very comfortable with the idea that slavery wasn't so dangerous. Another story is the story of Boson, and he's a slave who's convicted, not in Southampton County, but in the next county over, in Sussex County. Well, these handful of guys are convicted in Sussex County. They're about to be executed. And so what do they do? In the jail, the day before the execution, they say, let's bust out of here. And they do, a, they do bust out. A couple guys die in the escape attempt, but Boson escapes. In fact, the first time I saw this, I'd see these petitions from Boson four years after the Four years after the revolt, and I said, this is obviously wrong. This misdated. You get librarians, you have this in the wrong file, and it wasn't. Four years after the revolt, he started negotiating with people. He said, I'm willing to go back, but you have to promise you're not going to execute me. I'm out here. On I don't like it. I'm sleeping in the swamp. It's no fun. I'll go back to slavery, and you can send me off to Louisiana or do whatever you want to do with me, but don't execute me. That's the condition. But the problem is you can't really negotiate like that. Guy, a white guy comes walking down the street. He says, well, okay, that sounds reasonable to me, but he's got to get it from the governor, and the governor's 100 miles away. So the interesting thing, though, is when Boson starts negotiating with the white community, trying to get this thing, and actually, Boson's story is really good, because then he comes up, it doesn't work. He doesn't get a, get a, he doesn't get a solution. So he goes up to uh, another white guy, and he says, and I don't know who came up with this plan, but they come up with this plan. What we'll do is we'll pretend that I'm your slave, and we'll go to Newport News, and you'll sell me to Louisiana. And once I'm in Louisiana, Virginia's never going to find me, and I'll be, I'll be safe. I'll live. The only problem was the sale fell through when he got to Norfolk, and someone recognized him. So he got sent back to Southampton County. But when he's sent back, this is a guy who was, con you know, was convicted of, of joining the insurrection. But four years later, they're like, no, this guy, this guy was, he was, we were a little bit crazy. And in fact, you get petitions from people to the governor saying, please pardon this guy because what we did was over the top. He clearly wasn't involved in this revolt. And in fact, people from all over the county signed a petition on behalf of Boson. So it makes me think that they were successfully able to diminish it. And at that point, the difference between the non-slaveholders view and the slaveholders view goes away. Once you stop thinking of slaves as really people who are dangerous, then the slaves and the slaveholders can unite. If Turner's revolt gives us an ability to see hegemony in action. There's another way that this book is useful to someone who's interested in the Civil War. But to get to this, I want to get to the second way of thinking about the Civil War. According to this view of the Civil War, there's something approaching a state of war between slaves and masters that's sort of a permanent part of the system of slavery. Now, if you have this view, then the Civil War did not begin at Fort Sumter, and it did not end at Appomattox. But there was a war that was going on before the first slaves arrived in America in 1619. Bringing these slaves to America broke, brought a new front to this war, which included the Stono Rebellion, and then became a central issue in the American Revolution. And Saint-Domingue, the most successful front of this war, created a new nation, Haiti. But in America, the war continued, even if not in the usual ways that wars are fought. Slaves committed small acts of resistance, resisting work, running away, stealing, as a way to keep the wars of, uh, embers of this war lit. But it was not often that the slaves were able to blow on the embers and fan the actual flames of war. Still, there were a few of these plots and revolts in Richmond and Southampton and Char Charleston, South Carolina, that reminded slaveholders that slaves really didn't like slavery. Of course, the actual politics that led the leaders to wage war against each other was less interesting to the slaves who understand, understood that the war was a war over slavery well before Abraham Lincoln could get himself to the same conclusion. If the war did not start at Sumter and it did not end at Appomattox, as the war continued in a new form during Reconstruction and then during Redemption, the oppression of the white dominated governments and terrorist organizations like the KKK and the Whites of Night Camilla, and then the oppression of the Jim Crow era continued this war in a non-conventional form. 
And it is no coincidence that this view of the war has had increased purchase in an era when the great controversies of our era is having George Bush deliver a speech to the returning aircraft carrier group in front of a banner that proclaimed mission accomplished. If this is one's view of the Civil War, and I admit to being partial to this view, then there's no doubt that Turner's revolt is a part of this ongoing struggle. But Turner and the revolt ri reminds us how complicated this war is. We often think that abolition, in the words of Manisha Sinha, is the slave's cause. But this just flattens out black characters. Now, some slaves immediately signed up to join the revolt, but others did not. And I think I can tell a story here from the revolt that I, I think is revealing. Um, in the days after the revolt, the whites were scared. I mean, they did not want, they didn't know what was going on. They did not want to travel from plantation to plantation because they didn't know how many slaves were out there who were still in rebellion and who was going to die. So what they decided to do was to send messages using slaves to convey them. Because if the rebels were still out, a slave, a slave who was sending a message wouldn't be killed by the slave rebels. So anxious and scared whites uh, sent a slave named Burwell to three farms to request that the residents would go with the families to Mrs. Gurley's farm. Now, Burwell delivered this message but he discussed an encounter that began on one of the farms where a free black named Exum Artis interrupted him. Artis failed to convince Burwell um, not to deliver these messages for the white, but Burwell told Artis not to interfere with him. Artis was incensed. He, was in the, in the, he got very mad, that's what the source says. And unable to continue, uh, so Artis got very mad. Burwell wouldn't listen to him. In fact, he went to the next farm. And Artis followed him, trying to get him to stop. But he was unable to convince Burwell to stop helping the whites. So at one point, he grabs a pistol, where he got it, no one knows, and started threatening, threatening Burwell. If you keep delivering messages for the whites while the slave rebellion's going on, I'm going to shoot you, he declared. But this is where it gets interesting. At, they were at Mrs. Gurley's farm at this point. And the slaves on Mrs. Gurley's farm saw this fight taking place between the slave who was helping the whites and the slave who was trying to help the slave rebels. And what did they do? They immediately told tar artist to quiet down. If he kept up such noise, they said, the white people would come and shoot them or carry them to jail. They wanted to lay low. They wanted to avoid trouble. They wanted to stay safe at this moment of such insecurity. But this reminds us not to presume that we understand people simply because the color of their skin or their status. In Southampton in 1831, I saw signs of what W.E.B. Du Bois would later call double consciousness. And this reminds us that the role of blacks in the Civil War was not simply as foot soldiers in a cause that they were enlisted in as soon as they were born, but they were individuals as distinct as the mystical Nat Turner, the vengeful Will, the fearful Jack, or the intrepid Thomas Haithcock. All right, thank you. We have time for questions. So if anyone has questions about Nat Turner or its relation to the war, we have a microphone to take those questions. Um, my um, current history professor, Dr. Neff, actually uh, talked about um, Nat Turner a couple of weeks ago, and I never heard of him before then. Um, and I, uh, he mentioned that there's actually a movie coming up uh, called The Birth of a Nation. Um, and uh, I was just curious if you had any, uh, if you worked with the movie uh, in any capacity. Right. Nate Parker, the uh, director of the movie Birth of a Nation, which is coming out 
October 7th, um, is a, is a South, uh, Southside Virginia native, and he wanted to make this movie about a uh, birth of a nation. He was actually working contemporaneous with me. He didn't have my book. I didn't have his. So, uh, I didn't have his movie. So uh, when I see it on October 7th, it'll be the first time I see it. I think, obviously, look, it's a Nat Turner's presentation in history has been an incredibly contentious subject. Uh, and it's going to, I am almost certain that this will be a huge event in my field. Because if I can just give a brief history. Um, in, eight, in 1967, a novelist by the name of William Styron, a Virginia native himself, a white Virginia, wrote The Confessions of Nat Turner, a first person account of Nat Turner's rebe rebellion. He imagines himself and speaks in the voice of Nat Turner. This set off a firestorm. Um, I mean, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I can't even think of a recent firestorm that's been on the same scale. It was, in, it was incredibly contentious, especially once in 1968, black power activists started objecting. You know, who are you, southern white liberal, to start talking about who Nat Turner is? Uh, it was, and it was, for about a dozen years, 10 years, a dozen years, it was incredibly contentious. And one of the reasons why there hasn't been a lot of work done on Nat Turner was it sort of burnt itself out. Uh, his view of Nat Turner was fairly problematic uh, in the sense that at the heart of his novel was the story that is the story at the heart of the original movie, Birth of a Nation. Now, do you know the original movie, Birth of a Nation? Okay, 1950, 1914, 1950, it's this racist story of the Civil War. And at the heart of the story was the story of a mulatto who wants to rape a white woman. And that's what eventually bringed, br bring, brought the, uh, uh, the Union and Confederates together after the Civil War. Um, that idea of black lust for white women is actually one of the themes that comes up in Styron's Confessions of Nat Turner. So it's really problematic. Nate Parker is going to be arguing, you know, he's going to try to do a new version of that. One that celebrates, is much more uh, sympathetic to the black power view of Nat Turner. Here's a heroic figure. I, I am not connected to the movie. I suspect my feeling about the movie is he's going to be doing a lot of, a lot of black power stuff, uh, which, is, which, which is great. I mean, th so when he titles it Birth of a Nation, he's playing off this original Birth of a Nation, which is one of the most important movies ever made. Uh, so he wants to create a new version. Um, it's, going to be, it, it's going to be hugely important. And I'm going to be curious, uh, one of the things that happened, he portrayed it, at least at Sundance, you know, he portrayed it as the true story of Nat Turner. Um, and it's going to be interesting as a historian to sort of see how well he does with sort of the history. I encourage you all to see that. It's going to be fascinating. Yes, sir. I've read about uh, George Thomas, the uh, general from Virginia who right. was, uh, had to flee uh, during the revolt. Were there any other uh, major Confederate uh, officials who were affected by the revolt? And what were their uh, opinions after it? No, I, I don't. I'm, uh, I mean, obviously, this is, I mean, so Southampton is, um, it's a place that has lo long political divisions uh, among the whites. Um, so, but once Lincoln calls for the, the army, raises the volunteer and calls, calls for the army, and Virginia leaves, there's no disagreement among the whites. Um, so there's not a lot of uh, history there. The most famous figure in Southampton, actually, besides Nat Turner and, and Thomas, is Dred Scott. Uh, Dred Scott was actually born in Southampton, Virginia, but we have no idea um, how it, uh, the revolt affected him. Uh, but the direct, I mean, the, the, the direct, of, I mean, one of the things that's so weird is that there's a lot of places in Southampton, they actually had slave rebels, so they weren't like batting against shadows. Elsewhere, there were places like Wilmington, North Carolina, where they were afraid of a slave army that wasn't there. And so there was more of a response in some places other than Southampton. While in Southampton, 
the officials are really trying to tap down the response. So in some ways, there's less panic, or the panic doesn't last as long in Southampton as it does in other places. And in fact, when the move comes to um, push against slavery in 1832, it's not led by Southampton people. It's led by people from the middle of Virginia. Other questions? Yes, sir? Wait. Uh, I seem to recall that uh, Stephen Oates, a historian, wrote the definitive book on the Nat Turner Rebellion. How is your book different from his? Now? Um, hmm. uh, my book, well, <laughs> his, his book is, um, it's funny. There's a review of his book that comes out. Uh, his book comes out in, in a, a, you know, about a decade after the Styron affair. And Oates's book is a very dramatic retelling of the revolt. Um, one of the problems is that he doesn't necessarily uh, stick to the sources uh, in, in ways. Uh, he, he will do things like imagine Nat Turner's wedding ceremony, which, you know, so my book, I, you know, I, I come from an academic background. I'm obviously t hoping to write a book that's very accessible, um, but my book is not going to be, um, it's going to stay closer to the sources than Styron's book. It's sort of, the, the line in the revolt was, uh, was, it was sort of ironic that after a novelist got in so much trouble for taking liberties with the record, and obviously if he's speaking in Nat Turner's ver voice, William Styron was taking liberties with the records. That's what novelists do. Um, you know, but after that, to, to sort of in response to that, and he was very unhappy with uh, Styron's version of Nat Turner, uh, Stephen Oates comes out and uh, comes out with a version of Nat Turner that takes liberties with the record. Um, you know, it, it was, it's a nice, readable story of the revolt. Uh, I don't find it, I don't find it reliable. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh